morning. Um, I know Good this morning. was uh, Arizona time. If I were back in Texas, that would have been almost noon. But um, this is a, a session called, the title, Energizing Scholar Activism is an Interdisciplinary Dialogue. Um, the panel here and, and some of the panelists, they're gonna uh, introduce themselves, uh, really explores ways in which interdisciplinary scholarship can interrupt uh, structural oppression and energize activism in schools, community, and other social settings, right? So panelists, all, all of them will uh, draw from their critical scholarship working with indigenous communities, children and family in US borderlands and other settings, right? Um, while we're doing their anti-bias uh, educational work with communities. I am very honored to be facilitating this dialogue this morning. Uh, and I'm even more excited because uh, I'm very familiar with the great scholarship done by my colleagues, um, one on my left right here, and the other two on, on the screen uh, watching me or watching you. I don't know where they're seeing that because I'm not good in technology. Uh, but um, I'm just honored to be doing that work within great uh, scholars uh, that I could um, be part of this conversation. Some of you know me here, but my name is Bexis Wendemande. I was born and raised in South Africa under apartheid. Um, and I was educated in what was known Bantu education, a, a kind of education system that was only offered to black segregated schools. I currently teach at the University of Texas, San Antonio. And I very feel honored to be invited to this conference again because I'm coming here for, for the third time. So uh, that's why I met Flora here, my colleague, coming to this conference. So, <laughs> but yeah, but, but real quick, I just want to give a, a shout out to the organizers of this event. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Rector, I don't know if I got the last name correct. Uh, Dr. Suje Vega. Uh, Christine Lavette, uh, and other graduate students uh, on the planning team. Just a shout out to them, including uh, my mentor and uh, somebody who brought me where I am, uh, Dr. Blue, Beth Blue Swagner, sitting, sitting over there. Uh, that's the reason I got to be here uh, in terms of my scholarship as well, a lot of mentoring in there, I'm giving a shout out to them. So the panelists today, Dr. Flora Farago, who's uh, coming out of Stephen F. Austin University, she's right here. Uh, Dr. Michelle Salazar Perez, uh, who's at the University of uh, North Texas. Uh, and Dr. Jehan LBC at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, although uh, in many ways she does independent work, but she comes from that institution. We're very, um, Unfortunate that we were supposed to have another scholar here, uh, uh, Dr. Delphina Thomas, who's, a, who, who's here at Arizona State, but she couldn't uh, stay long for this weekend, so she went home. And without wasting a lot of time, um, I'll go ahead and ask the first question to the panelists. And it is that first question that the panelists will be able to introduce themselves to say who they are and, and what kind of work uh, they do. Uh, and in the interest of, you know, just procedures, uh, the first question I'll call the order, but the second and third question, the panelists will go any how they want to go. But the first one I'll just call you by order. So I'm going to start with you. <laughs> the first question, Dr. Farago, would be, uh, how did you became or begin to think about being a scholar activist? Thank you, and thank you everybody for being here this early Saturday morning, early for me anyway. So, <laughs> I'm Flora, and uh, I went to ASU. Uh, I was here uh, from 2010 to 2016, and was really fortunate to have some beautiful, amazing mentors in my life who are here in the room, Dr. Eva Mary Shiver, Dr. Beth Lou Swedener. Um, and so, they continue to inspire me to pursue scholar activism. But let me start at the beginning. Where else could we start, right? 
So I'll be honest with you. I was not, um, uh, activism for me uh, came way before scholarship. So I didn't know anything about scholarship when I was a young child, a young Jewish child growing up in Budapest, Hungary in the 1980s. Um, didn't know about scholarship or getting a PhD or anything like that. But what I did know is that I was Jewish and that my great grandparents were gassed in Auschwitz and that my great grandma and my great my grandmothers uh, were Holocaust survivors. So as a young child, as a young Jewish child in Hungary, I grew up with stories of survival, stories of anti-Semitism, stories of discrimination, uh, and stories of hope. So um, my grandmother, who is now 94, uh. Evi Nagy, lives in Budapest, Hungary, and um, she and her family were saved by an unlikely ally during World War II, right? During World War II, she was Jewish, she still is Jewish, and uh, what happened to her and her family is uh, there was a lady named Rose or Rozika, who was a non-Jew, a newspaper vendor on the street who hid my family, uh, my grandmother and her family in a cellar for five months, in a tiny cellar. Rozika risked her own life and her son's life to save my family during the Holocaust. So people like Rozika, and my grandmother's stories inspire me to fight for social justice. Um, I've been fortunate enough the, moving to the US. Um, yes, anti-Semitism is on the rise, but I'll be honest with you. I personally, it is on the rise, but I personally have not, thankfully, um, been on the receiving end of anti-Semitism. However, that is not to say that uh, anti-Semitism doesn't exist. Racism doesn't persist. Transphobia is all over the place. And so once I moved here, jumped forward a few decades, I uh, enrolled in graduate school here at Arizona State. I was very naive and maybe a little hot-headed and thought, okay, I can uh, maybe help figure out how to interrupt racism, anti-Semitism, sexism um, in early care settings. Not me interrupted, but how can we interrupt yeah. it with teachers and parents and scholars and activists? And so that's why I enrolled in graduate school. Let's interrupt racism, prejudice, stereotyping. <laughs> of course, um, I quickly realized that's not such an easy task, but what I did have a chance to do is meet amazing mentors, local to global justice family right here, Beth, Eva, folks like Demonde who continue to inspire me to merge scholarship, research, and activism. Thank you so, thank you so much. Uh, 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 thank you. And I'm gonna uh, move along as because we've just 30 minutes to be talking um, amongst each other, and then we're gonna invite you also to speak um, amongst all of us in here. I'm gonna move on to you, um, um, Dr. Salazar Perez. Uh, the question that uh, Flora just spoke to us, how did you uh, get into this work to become a scholar activist? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, and I also wanna give a shout out to Dr. Beth Schweitner. <laughs> I can't see you, but. I know you're there in spirit. Um, and so, oh, you didn't get to thank you. Can you see her? <laughs> no, I see some snow. Oh, but, oh okay. the table. <laughs> we looking at the table. Yeah, yeah she likes to come <laughs> in and sit in the front because everybody likes to see yeah. her. Yeah. But you have to go yeah. wave at them, he says. Uh, so I'm, oh. I'm alumni of, of, um, of Arizona. Oh, sorry. Is that Please okay. go ahead. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, I'm a little guy at Arizona State University. Um, I was there in 2005 and graduated with my PhD in 2009. So, of course, uh, Beth's influence is, is with me. Um, and so that definitely help, has helped to continue from that point and um, on today. Um, I, my background, um, I'm from South Texas originally. Um, I have a very mixed uh, race heritage. And what I identify most with is my Latina um, heritage and background. And um, like Flora talked about, I think that I was always uh, an activist at heart as a child with 
seeing some of the ways um, and experiencing oppression with family and community uh, throughout throughout my childhood. And then going really where I think um, my very strong activism was born, um, maybe more outwardly and apparent, was when I was a, a student at Texas A&M University in College Station, which is a very conservative um, space if people aren't familiar with it. And it used to be like a military school, and they they started admitting women in um, the '70s, I believe. So it has like a resonance of, of a lot of their their past ways of um, being and, and how they were birthed. So I was an undergraduate student there, and I was very um, I felt disconnected. I didn't I didn't feel at home there. I felt scared sometimes. Um, and I wanted to go home. Um, I thought I, maybe I should go back to Corpus down south. Um, and I met with my um, graduate resident director. I forgot what they were called, but there's a, an acronym for it. She was my hall director. Um, and she was a black woman on campus who was experiencing a lot of, um, of the same things that myself and other women of color in, when you enter the college field. And she encouraged me to go down to the, um, at the time, I think it was called like the Multicultural Center at Texas A&M. And I got to meet people who uh, were having the same experiences or allies or co-conspirators that were there uh, to support. And that changed my, it really changed my life and my passion and what I knew I wanted to do. And they had a program called Peer Diversity Educators. And so we would all meet together and we'd have, um, just, just time to be with each other. I felt connected to something and I felt like we were doing something um, as part of change and I didn't have to do it alone. I didn't feel isolated anymore. So I think that's the common thread of some of the things um, that that I know Demonde's um, prepared for us to talk about today. The common thread for me is not feeling isolated in this work because that's when I felt the most vulnerable and, and worried if I could continue it. But when I have people that um, are, are you know, in it with me, and we're thinking and being together and um, doing the work together. That's what's really inspired me um, to continue it and to want to be a part of it. So um, that's just I'll, I'll stop there. But that's that's definitely what that kind of started my spark <laughs> and continued on with the rest of what I've been doing. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Samuel Perez. I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna uh, come to you now, uh, Dr. LBC. Uh, that's the same question, just also people get to know how, how you got to this scholarship. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here and sending some love to Delphina and her family and also um, lost a great mentor to me, to me this re recently, uh, Dr. John Bracey, so just I uh, also want to thank you for allowing me to uh, greet you on your <laughs> land, um, and I'm greeting you from the land of the Pecumtuck and Nipmunk and Massachusetts and Wampanoag Nations in Massachusetts. And as Becca Seesway said, I'm an alum of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I made a very um, intentional decision after teaching for uh, a semester at the University of Connecticut at Storrs Multicultural Education to leave academia. Um, I was struggling with the ways in which institutional education was sort of constraining my uh, understanding of, of interrupting racism. And I can relate very much to Michelle's story and also to Flora's in having people who save um, their lives. Um, I myself became, um, was an activist before I was a quote unquote scholar. I still think that I'm learning how to be a scholar. So uh, thank you for sharing space with me and, and for acknowledging that. Um, Becca Seesway Demande is a very dear um, colleague. I wouldn't be here without him. and. He was a big part of my trajectory, but we could talk about that later when there's more time. Um, for me as a child, I was very sensitive and perceptive to my father's experience in a British occupied village in Africa, rural Africa. My name is Arabic and Muslim. I'm not Muslim, but uh, my name means the universe um, of the poor. 
of the family of the poor. Mm -hmm. And somehow that has played out and my, my financial trajectory has gone down, but my insights have increased. So, you know, there are these uh, cliche phrases we can cling to in, in revolutionary work or activism like Che Guevara's, um, you know, that, that the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love and the other one that if you want to be a revolutionary, you have to be willing to eat rats, and I would just change that to ramen. And, you know, uh, I've, I've had to um, eat a lot of crow and ramen along the journey, and so activism was born in me uh, um, experiencing great racism as a child in Northern Virginia. Just My parents were an interracial couple where they were refused a marriage license in, in, in three states before they were married. My mother was from Missouri. My father was from Egypt. Um, never identifying as Arab or Middle Eastern, those are misnomers, and he was Nubian or black Egyptian. So I can identify with Michelle, um, identifying with parts of her and her identity. And I'm very concerned in the direction that we're going with overemphasis on cultural or racial purity. And I talk a lot about racial fetishization, fet, sorry, I'm not saying, fetishization and colorism coming back. Um, I feel that very dramatically and it can isolate us as scholars and activists who are drawing from multiple identity uh, threads in our lived experience. And as a teenager, um, our water well was contaminated, our three drinking wells in the town where I was living at that time, which was Millis, Massachusetts, were contaminated. Uh, there were factories and, the, and people were dying at alarming rates from leukemia and brain tumors. And my mother and friends formed a citizen group to interrupt the uh, pollution and that resulted in con pollution control stacks being installed on the factories. It was a long fight, it resulted in death threats. It did uh, result in me to go and be adopted by my brother and live in Virginia because there were death threats and it was, it was a three year um, intensive struggle that played out um, again in the interest of time. I could go more into that, but that was my introduction and I did not appreciate her activism until uh, later when I realized how much I learned from her and many 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 years before Standing Rock she I, I went home one day from school crying and crying because it divided the town it divided the school in in the ways that interrupting environmental racism or pollution happens um, and I, I was crying asking her why are you why are you doing this to me? You're ruining my life. I'm in seventh grade, like you're wrecking my social life here. And she said, because water is life. And so when Chief Arva Looking Horse put that call out in 2016 for activists and for spiritual leaders to join um, this fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline, I responded because Number one, I had participated in a ceremony with Chief Arbor Looking Horse where he came to seal the eastern door where we live now in Massachusetts to protect our land. And I was very moved by, uh, by this ceremony. And so I, I, it was, it's beyond words what brought me there. And so I'm getting a little off track. And so as a child, I was learning about activism from my father's experience of escaping really a dictatorship in Egypt. And then later in college, it was in response to the Rodney King beating and riot, race riots broke out on the campus of the University of Massachusetts. And then like, I think it was Flora was saying, um, wasn't, uh, I'm sorry, I forget which one of you was saying, but this is this feeling of um, not necessarily being an activist, but then you become one. I was asked to speak on a panel as a young single woman of color in a PhD program with a baby, or sorry, in a master's program. And after I spoke on that panel, it just kept turning into more and more requests to speak up against the issues that were affecting a lot of us. And I began to be mentored by 
tried and true activist, one which was an Iranian political prisoner who had um, barely stayed alive. And then uh, moving forward, um, and so activism for me, the quintessential moment, if I were to encapsulate, would be in Standing Rock. And what I want to leave with you all today, because I feel like it's such a short time that we have together, which is it's impossible to really create the kind of transformation I'm interested in, in, in these tiny micro crushed segments of time. So I am very hopeful that we can come together again where we have more time to explore these. And I'm going to attempt very quickly to run you through a quick um, um, series of images. I, I didn't think I had this, but I, it may, oh, it's, it's disabled, so we won't go there. But I had some very short 30 second clips of some moments on the front lines of Standing Rock where the prayer was happening and it, it, it energetically, uh, in other words, it, it was civil disobedience in its finest where it actually, you could see this uh, effect that the energetics of nonviolent protests actually had a very dramatic, powerful, positive, productive outcome. So I went into Standing Rock broken, very broken hearted, tired, isolated as an activist in my home community, and I returned invigorated and energized, which is what drew me to your meeting here, and I love your title of re-energizing scholar activism and I feel that and so after Standing Rock I, I approached and had meetings with the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts and said I've been on a long hiatus a very long one but immersed in the trenches of walking for social justice and walking and you know when you're sitting in community groups with grassroots organizers suddenly, you know, your PhD is out the window. You are not the keeper of knowledge in those circles. You have to learn to listen and you become, um, you become one with that group that you're immersed in listening to. Um, I trained myself to bear witness to and listen to community elders and leaders. And I, I'm afraid I'm going over time, but this means a lot to me because I've been in, in, on the streets, literally, all this time. And so to reconnect with scholars who are working within the institutions and transforming those spaces, I feel very grateful to have an opportunity to return. Um, and the chancellor here gave me that opportunity to teach a course I developed from those experiences, but unfortunately, COVID, uh, COVID. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it means a lot to me to be here, and thank you so much, and it's a privilege to meet you, Beth. And I can't see you, but one day, I hope I get to see that studio and those sunsets that <laughs> I'm missing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. And I and I hope to tell a funny story about Becca Sizwe too, how he transcended his culture to help me as a single I was a single mom with a baby and he had just come to UMass from South Africa. We were in a course together. And of course you know Flora as a new mom that when you need diapers you need them quick and sometimes you don't have that extra set of hands and there was a miscommunication and Becca Sizwe thought that the professor was asking him to go to my car to retrieve some feminine products for me. And he had great hesitation because of his cultural uh, beliefs, but he decided to take a chance. I don't know why, but he did. And then he discovered it was for the baby and we all had a really good laugh and we became brother and sister uh, from that point going forward. So I hope it's okay I shared that, Dr. Demande, and Thank you for never giving up in on your sister Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alvisi. Um I how we're gonna plan this is to also 
get a larger conversation. So I'm going to just ask our panelists on one more question that we'll talk about. And if I may request just one minute, or all three of you, then because this yeah. this is not like a traditional AERA where just people who know are going to talk, but we're going to get you in it. But the only question that I'm going to ask the panelists, and you could start uh, anyhow, uh, would be, what do you perceive as challenges in your current work and likewise? There may be moments of appreciation and beauty amidst the struggles. What would those be? Just in, in, in one minute, just to share that, or if no more than two minutes. Anybody can start. If it's, is it okay with Michelle and Flora if I just go ahead and throw it out? Uh, please, so, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. So I think polarization and division is one of the greatest challenges now, at least in terms of some of the organizations that I work with. There's so much misinformation and so little time to come together to sort out these polarizations. And so coming to some sort of consensus of where are we headed? And then the beauty, I found, again, I'll just return to saying I found it in Standing Rock and I, I bring that with me wherever I go because the entire world showed up there. And the, the cultural, racial, national, international differences that were represented in that condensed period of time showed me that this beloved community, to use the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, are possible. We can achieve this and we cannot, and when we give one another the support and cooperate versus competing and, and really work on these things that have changed us and share those with others in changing these environments where we may have felt previously constricted, um, that's where I find the beauty. I, I found it there in prayer with Lakota and the world, the entire world. Um, you know, a woman came to Albuquerque, New Mexico from Japan, rented a car, drove to Standing Rock and came to the fire circle and approached the microphone and said, I only have one hour to present the Japanese flag to show you that we are with you. And then she left. It, it was just more incredible than I'm giving it, but that's my minute. and. Uh, uh, he he, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. LBC. I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Perez, um, to give us no more than two minutes co commentary on the same question. If you still have it, you want to say again? Or you have it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I would say um, the challenges that I've been facing is that it feels like once, once we've figured out something and transformation is happening, it, it's another thing that kind of comes from, from a different direction and sometimes it can feel surprising or we have to figure out new ways to push back on it or to change it and I feel like that um, with, with some of the exhaustion that you can feel in doing this work, um, it can feel it's discouraging and frustrating at times when you see sometimes it feels like it's going backwards, you know, with, with stuff happening in Texas and around around the, um, the U.S. Um, with policies that are really hurting our um, children of color in schools and communities and, um, and also other minoritized, people from other minoritized positionalities. And so I feel like that's one of the things that I, I feel um, frustrated by, but that's something that is um is part of our history and i think that it doesn't mean that it's not insurmountable so that gives me some hope in that and and some of the beauties is uh, like the community that's fostered and i'm kind of hearing that as well from um Jahan's, um you know, a, a discussion and um, what you've shared it's so beautiful thank you for sharing what you have um and and i feel like that that community that's fostered the people who become your um co-conspirators for for a lifetime sometimes or sometimes it's a moment but it stays with you forever those moments and those experiences and those people that you can um, come together with to think together and to do together those are the parts that are beautiful and that give me energy and and make me want to continue to be a part of the change so I'll stop there thanks okay. 
thank you, uh, Dr. Perez. Uh, I'm going to move over now to you, colleague. Well, Dr. I feel Dr. like, Dr. my Dr. friend, you have not had time to speak, so I would like to give my talking stick over to you, <laughs> if that's okay. Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, I, I came in here to facilitate, but if you want me, if you really want me to talk, um, I, I can take one minute just to Please. tell, <laughs> go to the first question to say why I actually um, came to this work. Um, when I introduced myself, I did mention that I was born and raised in, in, in apartheid South Africa, and people who uh, understand what apartheid was, then you, you see my background. Um, I usually um, talk about two things um, in this, when I think about this work. Um, talk about the community who uh, guided all of us, like myself, growing up, and, and how to navigate this challenging situation where you are at the school, and then you have to make sure that how you're gonna dodge the bullet in a public school classroom when, when the military comes in. So think about how black mothers will tell us what to do, which is similar here what, um, you know, what the police are, are doing in the United States, you know, just the recent case in Memphis, right? But um, really I live with what's called the survivor guilt. So that's what brought me to my work because the survivor guilt that I live with um, is just, um, uh, the times when I don't want to talk about it because I always know that um, there were friends who were killed at that time and even student leaders who were killed who were just comrades, we call each other comrades. That's, that's a term that we use in South Africa in solidarity. So that's really what uh, propelled me to, to do this kind of work. So you, you, you still have the last, uh, oh. 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I don't have much to add except okay. that uh, we are banning books on LGBTQ youth and, and trans youth in schools. We are outraged about critical race theory. Um, in Texas, the governor is trying to get rid of diversity, equity, and inclusion offices on college campuses and, for, and just sent a, a letter to public state universities, including where I work, that you have to pause diversity, inclusion, and equity hiring practices. Um, we keep expelling, suspending black youth at three to five times the rate from schools that white youth. So I'm gonna stop there. We have a lot of problems and a lot of issues to, to solve. And it seems like we take two steps forward, like Dr. Perez said, and one step back. But hope, this is, this is hope. He's hope, your hope, my, my, my friendship and uh, community with fellow scholar activists, and local to global justice is hope. So I will stop there for the sake of time and I would love to hear from, from you and all of you about hope and moving forward. Okay, thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you. Uh, and we'd love now to, uh, to have that dialogue as this panel says is a dialogue. It's not the dialogue of the panelists but it's a dialogue of, of us as a community in this room. So, uh, and questions? You could, can go to any one of us, uh, or dialogue. No. Can dialogue could be directed to any one of us? They're not Sorry. questions. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Hello, I'm Christian, and I, I came in really late. I'm sorry about that. But as I listen, for example, of the challenges, right, and persistent challenges, especially in Texas, as you said, um, I'm just thinking about a strategy. I'm thinking about you know has the you know, the traditional strategy we've employed to uh, advocate, to, has that worked? And if, if not, can we think about a new strategy? I'm, I'm thinking about Gladwell, the tipping point, no? Or, or where is the tipping point here? Mm. And, and how is it that, that we can begin to collectively think about other strategies for influence? Um, yes, at local, but also at much you know, national, international level. That's just a question I have. I don't have an answer to that. I just wonder collectively what could that strategy look like, possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you know, Christian, I don't know your last name, I just know you by first name because you're a friend. <laughs> Christian is uh, fine. Okay, good. But uh, um, I'm going to ask one of the panelists just to take a step on that 
just maybe for one minute and maybe share that question. Just one minute, take a step. Any, anybody, excuse me, this has- It's still on, the Monday. It's, oh, it's still on? Feel free, oh, okay. 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 I thought okay. But that one is, that one is still on the sleeve. Oh, so what, but that's the one that we're looking at him at? This one. Okay, yeah, let me, okay. Oh, this song. Oh, you want to start while I'm Okay, I thought, what strategy? I know you. That's why. Thank you for that question. I mean, I, I don't have a clear answer to that and I want to keep it very brief. I just believe that eventually all of us will believe in the dignity and power of all human beings, including queer youth, including black youth, and eventually one day in a utopian world, um, I don't know when that will be, in a utopian world, we won't have to do convincing that this work is needed. Honestly, how we get there, I, Please, audience members, panelists, please uh, enlighten us because sometimes I, I, do, I don't know. I don't know. That's a beautiful question and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Thank you so much, Flora. Uh, colleagues, can you, can you hear us? I can. I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Uh, first of all, I only see the desk and a little bit of Becca C's way. It's a little trouble hearing the panelists, but I'd like to say something to speak yeah. to the questions. Yeah. Can I just say something real quick? Uh, oh yeah. Th there is a glitch in here. Uh, this this is oh. my computer, and I didn't bring the charger for it, so that's why you don't see us clear. The, oh, the back okay. is there, so oh, we'll just God. have to complete without oh. having this. But go ahead, please. Well, she has a charger. Oh, yeah. oh okay, good. Okay, oh. okay. If it works, because this is a 2010 computer, so it's very mm -hmm. old. Please go ahead. Oh, People so can wait have... here. Without really hearing the beginning, and I won't uh, go on and on, but the, strate the strategy that I'm working with very um, prayerfully, intentionally, is with indigenous leadership at this time. This world is in crisis, and we are all sort of brought together with our shared and different intergenerational trauma and traumas, and I work with indigenous leaders, spiritual leaders, and activists toward creating, well, the strategy would be following indigenous leadership in the local, local to global levels and in and out thereof. You know, in other words, global to local and local to global. Uh, anything colonization and racism and white supremacy and those evils that led to the Holocaust and that have us living in a present day genocide. And I call it genocide. And it affects many things for my life. So you have to be discerning when making your decisions on what to bring your energy toward because it can be squandered, exploited, and you can wind up exhausted, and you can wind up dead. And I say that because Becca Seesway has lived through the kind of activism where he saw comrades die. And I had to make a decision on two instances in terms of strategy. So the strategy that I was involved in at the time was walking through communities with Buddhist monks and activists to bring energy and attention to a particular issue. In this particular case, we were walking for nuclear non-proliferation, and it was a walk for the remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And on that walk, a right-wing Trump supporter with the flags on the truck drove by and was doing the thing with the truck and threatening us we were walking along the side of the road and he turned into a dirt road and then went inside where we lived and brought out a gun and was firing and firing that in the air and it was quite terrifying. We were in a very rural section of, of Massachusetts in a conservative area, a group of maybe 20 or 30 of us walking and I asked myself deeply as an activist that had been on many peace walks is this worth dying for right now? Is this worth my life? Is, am I, what am I risking my life to accomplish here right now as an activist? 
And I answered myself, no. I care about nuclear nonproliferation. I care about the remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I do care to not repeat the sin. I don't want to die for this right here, right now on this hill. But when I made the decision to go stand for the water, I decided, and I left a note for my son in case I didn't come back. And I fortunately was able to escape bodily harm there. I was there September, October, and December, and there, the youth and the real, I call them the real warriors, because I was there, but there were young people that never stopped going to the front lines. But in coming home, I faced more violence by Illinois State Police than I did on the front lines in Standing Rock. And I realized I was I was making decisions as an activist to participate in strategies that were bringing the negative attention of police, law enforcement, and I faced very severe consequences upon returning home, which I won't go on and on about. So to answer your question about what are the strategies, I feel right now that the, that the strategies that work are following indigenous leadership because they are the ones who are the keepers of the knowledge on on protecting this land and this water that is theirs. And I feel strongly about that at this time. And so the work that I continue to work on is land back, water protection. My activism began with the water and continues with the water. And I really mean it. I mean, listen to the water, listen to the earth. We are in institutions of higher education. Like you've mentioned, these things are, we're being uh, to, uh, attacked on all sides, so to speak. But I recalled something the other day because the amount of emails generated by some of these difficulties with attacks on policy that are happening at an accelerated alarming rate where we can become quite fearful that we're entering a mode of fascism that we're, we're in other words it's cascading down faster than we anticipated and how do we regroup and stand together and stay strong in that context and i was walking in the forest and i remembered you know at 23 years old i was initiated through sweat lodge and pipe ceremonies and i remembered the woman telling me just go down to the ground and put your face in the mud when it gets too hot. And I suddenly had this realization that life is like that. You know, in other words, when things get too hot and too chaotic and too crazy, the strategy is return to what, return to what makes you human, whole, and healthy. And the other stuff is going to be swirling around. Yes. But don't squander your scholarship or your energy on strategies that either put you at risk um, in ways that you're that you don't feel that that is worth laying your life down for, and and I'm sorry to be so intense about it, but we are in these times, and the energy that I try to cultivate on a daily and it takes practice and intentionality is gratitude, joy and well-being and balance mm -hmm. with our environment and we've got to protect the natural resources and that's the strategy i encourage you to take okay thank you jan um